Mm. Okay, it seems that the recording started. Uh, so, this is an official ITF meeting. Uh, it's a cozy interim meeting. And uh, as an official ITF meeting, the note well applies. Uh, I believe everyone on the call is already familiar with it, but I guess if anyone has any questions uh, regarding uh, that, please uh, let the chairs know. So this is our agenda for today. We will uh, be going through a few administrative uh, things and discussions on drafts and charter and uh, our expectation is the bulk of the time to be dedicated to CBOR certificates. Hi. This is Russ. Um, I sent yeah. you some slides for countersign. Yes, uh, that uh, for now is put under the update of uh, draft data. Ah, okay. That's but perfect. We'll, we'll show your slides. That's perfect. Thank you. Yes, thanks for uh, checking this. Uh, so, okay, let's continue. If there is no bashing of the agenda, then. So, I uh, already presented the note well. Minutes will be taken at uh, this uh, URL. Uh, for now, we don't have an official minute taker. We are looking for someone to help us with the action items. Any volunteers? Uh, this is Russ. I'll I'll help with the minutes, but somebody else needs to do it while I'm talking. Okay, that sounds perfect. Thank you, Russ. And uh, yeah, I think. We'll be able to handle the jabber with uh, Matthew. Okay, uh, yes, if you want to see the slides, here is another link. Otherwise, they are also in the data tracker. And uh, if you haven't uh, put your name in the uh, minutes, please uh, add yourself to the uh, attendees there. Okay, so with that, we can move to the document status um, for the hash algorithm and uh, RFC 8152 bis aux. They are uh, in the RFC editor queue waiting for uh, the struct document. Uh, for the strip document, there are a few edits that are still remaining, and uh, Matthew is going to uh, follow up on them. I don't know, Matthew, if you have anything to add about this now, or? There's nothing to say more about this right now. It's It's very slowly in progress. Okay. And then for the X509 document, uh, I submitted a new revision like one or two days ago. Uh, and there were a few things that were still raised as comments or things that might be considered. I listed a few of them here. Uh, so one of them was that now the document is made standard track document, uh, as it was discussed during the ISG uh, review. Um, yes, the idea was other people to be able to uh, depend on it, and there was no reason that we could see why not do it a standard track document. Uh, if anyone has any objections, please let us know. Uh, another point that Ben raised was that maybe uh, there would be something for uh, X509 and counter signature. Uh, there are some 
overlappings maybe between them and uh, we need to see which of the two documents would be handling that. Um, yes, are there any opinions on this? Okay, so uh, I will bring this to the mailing list uh, as a separate item, but uh, yes, it was in Ben's review if anyone wants to look at it uh, before that. Uh, so yes, this is an action item for me. Uh, and then uh, the uh, reference to RFC 8152 was uh, uh, informative and uh, that was changed to normative because as uh, Ben pointed out, it didn't feel correct uh, to uh, have the document reference uh, RFC 8152 just as informative. Uh, informative reference. And uh, similarly, as for the counter signature, I think uh, there was a question whether uh, we want to be able to directly support CBOR certificates in X509 or what is exactly maybe it's in the document uh, for CBOR certificates uh, that we are going to uh, add this, but we might just want to make sure the text uh, in the X509 uh, draft doesn't, uh, doesn't stop us from doing this. So those were some points. Uh, uh, about the X509 document that I thought uh, are worth mentioning here. And hey, uh, th this is Jonathan. Um, it was pointed out in reviews that um, the previous version referenced the GitHub uh, examples and that there were no examples for X509. Um, so yeah. that text was removed in the latest version. Uh, but I did submit a pull request to the examples repo with some examples for X509. Right. Well, that's a good point. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Yes, then we can add back the link and uh, that would be uh, something I will look at. And yes, please uh, write to the action items uh, for me also to do that. And uh, uh, Logan says, I think you might also have some points to discuss. Uh, I thought it could be an easier to discuss them now, but yes. Uh, hi, this, this is Lawrence. Uh, were you uh, asking me there? Yes, yes. Ah, okay. Um, so one way to frame this might be harmonization with uh, the, the really similar header parameters in JWS, because JWS has a, an X5T, an X5 chain, and an X5U. It doesn't have an X5 bag. Um, and there's uh, a few things that are different um, between them uh, or maybe not as clear in the, the X509, because uh, the X509 draft, as they are as clear in the JWS draft. Um, so one of them is identification of the end entity uh, cert uh, certificate. Um, I wrote an email on that. Um, the other is the um, whether the headers are protected or not. Um, and uh, in, in my view, uh, JWS uh, Section 6 uh, handles that really well, and um, it seems like it would be good to have the same thing in COSE X509. Um, 
and I, I've mentioned this a few times, I, I don't know if you want me to file issues or just emails or whatever you think is best, but um, th those are those are two. And then um, maybe there's also some harmonization with uh, the, on the X5U parameter in terms of the way it's treated from a security point of view. Um, I, I haven't looked at that one as closely, but it seems like they're, they're they are also different. Uh, yes. Oh, yes, it's possible. Could you file issues, uh, for example, in GitHub? Oh, sure. And then it, uh, yeah, I will. I will look into that in uh, more details. And also, if you have any suggestions for text uh, for the harmonization, that would be really appreciated. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, any other uh, comments about this document? Um, yeah, I, I recognize this is Jonathan Hamill. Um, so I, I recognize that you want to make it aligned with um, JWS, and but I, I'm not sure that it's clear that these um, header parameters should always be in in protected headers. Um, particularly in section six of 7515, it says that they only must be integrity protected if the information conveyed is utilized in a trust decision. And if it's not, if the trust decision only uses the key, then they need not be. And so I'm not sure that's entirely clear of what the decision should be made, um, particularly when uh, when you take the example of um, of CMS, where certificates are not uh, protected by signatures, or um, and and the and the signatures on the certificates themselves protect additional parameters. I don't know if anyone else had thoughts about that. Yeah, I have a few thoughts about that. This is Lawrence again. Um, my understanding, I mean, I, I was kind of thrown for this, thrown for a loop on this myself, um, but two things changed my mind, um, or I guess the way I would frame it is CMS didn't address this. This was a, this is kind of a new attack or a new uh, sort of new vulnerability. Um, and uh, it's, a, you know, Ben in his discussion of X5U, uh, you know, kind of brought up the, the point. Um, and uh, then um, the fact that JW, JWS uh, addresses it, um, uh, th that was kind of the two points there. Um, uh, and I, I agree that they should not always, they don't always have to be in protected headers, They, but sometimes they should be. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the, the, the basic attack here is that a, a CA issues two certificates with the same key, but different uh, extensions like uh, or usage th things like usage like um, extended key use or you know path length constraints. So they they issue two two different certificates with the same key, but different characteristics. So therefore, you really do need to make sure your references to the certificate, not just to the key. So I'm kind of keying off of what JWS did and what Ben said, and it does make some sense to me. So, so from what Ben said, he he argued specifically on the um, X5U parameter to be in protected headers because of it was that there was no trust between the um, accessing the URL. Um, for to to obtain the certificate, and um, it, it, in the example you gave with the um, certificate authority changing the certificate parameters, I think that 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 that's a really I, I don't know um, I don't know of a of a of a CA that would would actually do that without revoking the other without the uh, revoking the other certificate, changing properties of it particularly. It, it could change like uh, 
issue a new expiry date, but changing key usage without revoking the other one, would, I think, would be a dangerous operation for for a CA to to do. And uh, but I'm also not sure what like like particularly what the attack is. Like the the attack would only be if if your if they actually restricted the key usage further in the second issuance and didn't revoke the original one. And so um, if they, th that, that to me, it would be a failure in the, in the X509 certificate management. Um, so I agree that uh, a CA that does this seems a little bit lame, um, maybe a lot lame. Um, uh, um, I do think that the expiration date is uh, is uh, of similar consequence here as um, the uh, key use and path length and other other things in the certificate. Um, and then on you know Ben's argument, when I read Ben's argument, I thought that. Uh, it, you know, it was about this other other fields in the certificate. Um, so it seemed to me that Ben's argument extended to um, all forms of identification of the end entity, not just X5U. Uh, he never followed up on that to answer that, whether he thought that was true or not. So I don't really know what he's thinking. Um, and then, and then when I read the section six of JWS, it seems to line up with that. So. Um, I, I agree it's kind of an obscure thing, but uh, in, in, a, in a way, but um, I think the, the lineup with JWS is good. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to take too much longer uh, with this in the agenda, but um, if you can propose, if you have some text that would clearly state when it should be in a protected header versus uh, allowing it in an unprotected header, I'd be willing to review that. Yeah, I and mean, the only thing I'm I'm, I'm after is, is the same as just JWS. So. And Ben also joined, so we'll be able to ask him. Uh, I'm wondering how much time will we need for the other points, and whether that is something that we can follow up on the mailing list with. Uh, but uh, yes, so. Ben, uh, just a little bit of context for what we were discussing is uh, the protected uh, headers in X509. Uh, and uh, yes, there was a discussion in the mailing list. Do you want to follow up on that on the mailing list or do you want to discuss this now? Okay, that works. Uh, okay, then let's uh, continue with the counter signature document. Uh, so please, Russ, go ahead. Okay, uh, just a little while ago, 02 was posted. Um, next slide. So in it, there are examples, two of which were provided by Jim Shad, and many thanks to Jonathan for uh, providing three more examples. Uh, though he did PRs uh, against the document, and I pulled them in. Uh, I believe he also put them in the examples uh, repo. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
And so uh, I would really appreciate it if some folks would check the examples. Um, I, I know that uh, Michael Richardson had previously said that he found the examples were necessary to uh, understand exactly how to implement. And so uh, it's good that we have more. I notice he's not here. Uh, but I think uh, with that change, uh, the document's now ready for last call within the working group. Uh, hopefully, somebody can check the examples as part of that last call. That's it for me, unless there's questions. This is Jonathan. I just wanted to mention that the PR for the examples repo contains more examples than were included in the draft. So, so there's more examples there. You've been busy. Thank you. Okay, uh, chairs, I hope we're ready for last call. I'm not hearing anybody yes. object to it. Yes, I think uh, that should be fine. I will discuss with uh, Matthew, but yes, I, I think it should be fine to have the last call sometime soon. Okay, and then... And uh, rechartering. Uh, so for the rechartering, what would, would you mind uh, giving us an update? I think there were uh, some merge requests that were merged. Yes, yeah, so we, we merged the two PRs, and then I think uh, Garan had some concerns with that that we may have to back those out. They were. Um, around around the certificate stuff, um, the certificate options there. Um, Goran, do you? Um, yeah. I, I, I need a reminder here. I'm, I don't know what, what I promised to do or, or what I should do. No, no, this is, um, you, you had mentioned at some point some um, concern with the latest test around um, Excuse me. This text for uh, in the charter around the uh, certificate. I thought I provided my input there. Uh, sorry, um, do you have a, do you have the charter in front of you? I, uh, it's not visible on the slide. At least not okay. in my slide. I, uh, let me try to open that. There. So, yeah, I apologize. I, I thought I had provided the input and I was happy with what, what I saw, but oh. let's, have another, let's have another look. Or we can do this offline if, 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 uh, okay. if it's just me, me waiting for I can provide. So, let's have a look. Uh, let's see. So, okay, there is one more pull request. What I, what I remember is that we we noted that the charter that actually the work on the draft on the Thebor certificates draft had actually uh, gone beyond the charter, and I wanted to have that uh, since there was an agreement in the in the working group around what what the Thebor certificate draft should be about. I wanted that reflected in the charter. That that was basically my input, but. Okay. It was a major, major comment. And I think this. It seems like you are not providing any. Did you write that on the list, or it doesn't seem like there's any pull request for your change, John? Uh, I probably missed it. So allow me to get back to you on, on the. Yeah. Okay. I remember your comment. It was changing it to referring to RFC 5280 instead. Something. Yep. In the or in addition. Yeah. 
Action Yes, please. Yeah. From Gorham. Okay. I mean, what what the chairs can do is we can we can push this in its. Um, um, the only other pull request that's in there right now is to delete all the um, essentially all the stricken out text. Um, so we can merge that and send it around, um, send it onto the mailing list for review. Um, and if there's any any other uh, questions or concerns with it, then we can address it from there. Does that sound reasonable? Yes. yes. Okay, and with that, I think it's time for CBOR certificate. Thank you. So uh, the last submitted version is 05, and since then there have been some new issues, some work on GitHub, and some discussion on the list. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, next slide again. Uh, so just very quickly summarizing changes from zero three to zero five. Uh, I've not received any comments on the list, but so basically compressed and then removed in the whole document. We will update the file name at a later point. Uh, pr probably uh, when it's adopted and we have to change the file name anyway. Uh, we added a reference to IEEE DevID and made optimizations for DevID. Uh, there was a comment that it was not really clear how this mapped to version 3. So we have added version 3 in a lot of places to make it very clear that uh, this is for version 3, and version 3 is encoded in the CBOR certificate type. Removed some optimizations that was uh, not necessary. Changed serial number to unwrapped uh, CBOR positive big num. Changed time to CBOR epoch time. Added a special encoding for no expiration date which is basically the maximum time positive. Um, then also used uh, the Seaboard tax OID, RFC for OIDs and the CDL in there. Removed the term relative, which Russ pointed out was used wrongly. Uh, then we have change to omit signature instead of signature algorithm. It makes that the algorithm the algorithm comes just before the signature itself. Uh, so, next slide, unless there's any comments. Uh, added organization identifier, change for that UTF strings have a positive sign in the native. Uh, enabled encoding of email address, fix the ambiguity with hex encoding pointed out by Russ. Added support for other name and also added uh, optimization for hardware module name. That's a type of other name which is used in DevID. We added support for red registered ID. Uh, this was easy to do when we find out that it was used in some IoT policy. Then we added CBOR encoding for authority and subject key identifier. These are basically used in all um, certificates on the web. Uh, added and also, uh, yeah, CRL distribution point and authority info access. Same there, there's also used. Uh, next slide. Uh, as Michael Richardson requested, we moved the char one signal algorithms to two byte encoding, uh, corrected some CDDL to 
correctly map allow or not allow empty sequence and sets and a public and private key for uh, for the ECA key uh, so it's possible to verify the test vectors example certificates in the draft and a note about kid and added consideration for experts uh, so yeah, so Karsten posted he wants to change from unsigned to positive or positive to unsigned. Yeah, good. Fix that. Uh, no, if there's no comments on done changes, then we can move on to planned and ongoing changes. So. Uh, so this is uh, what has already been done in the GitHub version, if you follow this, is that we have added references to some other well-used um, X509 profiles, the CA browser forum baseline requirements, that's basically used by all browsers and therefore all certificates on the web. And also to CNSA X509 profile, which has been published as an RFC. We recently got several requests to add CNSA cipher suits to ad hoc. This might, so this might be useful here also, just to make sure that we are compliant with, uh, with both of these profiles. Then I added more references and text um, for other non-constrained protocols where certificate and certificate chain sizes might be a problem and therefore small encodings are, might be useful. One example is EAP TLS. Their access points typically drop the EAP connection after a while. So large certificate basically makes uh, if you have a large certificate which happens in practice you cannot authenticate another recent example is quick uh, where uh, the uh, i don't know the quick terms but the server hello uh, can basically be only three times larger than the client hello what the client sent so uh, Unless you can fit in that restrictions, you will add another round round trip. This I've seen being discussed by Cloudflare in a blog where they show that TLS certificate compression uh, is important here and uh, improves performance. I think Seaboard certificate could potentially also help here, but we would need concrete data on that in that case. Uh, then they add, we would like to add an example encoding of a dev ID certificate. Would be very good, good if somebody has such a certificate so we can um, make it more relevant instead of trying to uh, create one just from the dev ID specification. That could lead to, it would be a, probably a correct dev ID, but maybe not how they are used in practice. Um, and I don't think, I think Michael Richardson has, maybe he could help. I don't think he's on the call today. Um, yeah, you are. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand the question because um, I was actually trying to send a message to the group. Um, what, yeah. what was the part about the example certificate? Yeah, so we would like we would like to be useful for to compress dev ID certificates, and we yep. would like to add an example certificate in the draft. So, do you have any dev ID? I I, I definitely around? do. I definitely do, and I definitely was thinking about how how we could do a test case for this. Um, mm -hmm. So I certainly can compress it and uncompress it. But I was actually then I had a different thought, which was. Um, Probably there's some advantage in DTLS to compressing the certificate, even if the rest of the DTLS is is big. 
because a certificate is could be a uh, especially if it's a chain could be more than a kilobyte in size um and so i was thinking how could we put, test this whole thing in practice with dtls and so i was actually wondering to myself um and maybe it speaks to the previous point as well do we need to have do we need to allocate or are we already allocating a tls certificate type that says i'm a compressed certificate uh, yes, we do. Oh, we are doing that. Okay. Yeah. So we could actually hack this into the code right now and see how it performs. Yes. There. Okay. Uh, that's great. So uh, then we, uh, then I expect some uh, example dev ID certificate from you. If you pr provide that, I, I could, I can compress it and add it to the to the draft. Um, I'll try to do that for mid January. Yeah. Sounds great. No hurry. Uh, then we are planning to, the draft already have an example HTTPS RSA certificate, the ones from tools.itf.org. We plan to add one uh, ECDSA certificate as well. And then coming back to basically what Michael just said, we would like to have more more realistic data on what compression you would, could uh, do in TLS. And as we have found out, our understanding is that Brotly is what is used in practice. So we are planning to change from sublib to Brotly. We would have like to have um, ex uh, numbers for numbers for example certificates and change for Brotly, Cbor, and Cbor plus broadly if this is now a certificate type you can use it with tls certificate compression um, and then we have uh, on github removed the asn1 appendix it was very rfc 7925 specific uh, and the draft is now uh, supporting a much larger subset uh, we have suggested to the authors of 7925BIS that they should add uh, ASN1 instead. But uh, if they will, it's out of our, our hands right now. Um, any comments on here on this? No. Let's move on so we can... Good. Uh, then we have gotten a comment that we should have the private key to the public key in the example certificates. This this allows to use the example certificates for test vectors in ad hoc. That has been requested. So that's the plan for zero six. Um, has been request for more deployment guidance for IT, what should you choose and so on. Uh, this is more high level point, should probably be added at some point, but uh, I don't have a clear view of exactly how this deployment guidance should look like. Could also be in other drafts than this. Uh, then we tested the encoding on a, on the set of HTTPS certificates on the web. And we found out that there's quite a lot of attributes that we had not registered. For example, street address, postal code, business category, jurisdiction of um, uh, incorporation of country name, etc. There's We only tested a quite small set of certificates and already found four. Uh, then street address and postal code are are included in this uh, browser forum baseline requirement, so we made registrations for them. For all other attributes, we uh, made so that you can use a OID byte string encoding. So uh, the proposal is to n not do any seaborne encodings for this, but make sure that all certificates can be compressed. Any comments on that? Everybody agrees to everything. That's great. Um, 
Then last slide, which, uh, no, it was not the last slide. So we also received quite a lot of comments about the, uh, the IANA tables, especially the algorithms that it was a bit unclear um, which parameters was supported and not, and also exact encoding and that the identifiers were a bit unclear. So we completely rewrote them. We removed the identifiers and gave them more descriptive names. And then we skipped the old uh, format. And now there's a one mapping between the Seaboard value and the their encoding of the whole algorithm identifier. Uh, we believe this simplifies things and also make them more strict and exact. It also allows uh, use of uh, it allows registration of algorithms with any form of parameters, and we now added a uh, we all previously supported RSA with null, which may or may not be a parameter and the named curve. But now we can also support RSA PSS, which is at least mentioned in both the browser baseline requirements and CNSA, even if I haven't seen any use on the web. Um, any comments on that? No. Then last slide, which hopefully have people will have comments on. So this was uh, discussed on the list raised by Lawrence uh, about how easy, it, easy or hard it is, is to implement the current draft or the CBOR sequences and CDL with current CBOR encoders, decoders. And the question is, should we make any changes to make it easy to use? Uh, and the problem, correct me if I'm wrong, Lawrence, is that it's hard to access a subpart of the encoded CBOR to verify the, uh, to put as an input to the signature to ver verify that. And one of the suggestions was to wrap the to be signed uh, structure in a byte string. That makes it easier to parse out. Uh, then there was a comment from Stefan that he thought it was quite easy to calculate offset with tiny Seabor and also in his own Rust implementation. Joel pointed out that the small size on the wire is important. Um, Karsten pointed out that uh, use a prefix uh, is uh, yeah, Carsten can explain that himself but uh, yeah so basically when we did CBOR we, we uh, focused on having a single data item and, and so all the, the initial CBOR uh, APIs focused on that um, but uh, then we found out about uh, the streaming and and CBOR sequences and all that and and um, most or many CBOR implementations I haven't done the scientific study of that um, actually grew some some APIs uh, to to actually work with uh, sequences and uh, working with with sequences doesn't just mean that you have uh, sequences of encoded. Uh, data items, but it also means that you can have um, a situation where you have uh, one or even maybe more, in this case it would be 10, uh, encoded CBOR data items, and then uh, something else following. And um, this would uh, work uh, with a specific situation uh, we have here. So I gave some examples for, for uh, decoder APIs of decoders that I have written, but of course I, I couldn't do this work uh, for all 65 um, implementations that are on CBOR.io, so we probably need to do a little bit more surveying there. Uh, but right now I'm, I'm pretty optimistic uh, that uh, we wouldn't create ourselves uh, a big deployment 
a problem by going with the the way things are done in Desho 5. Yeah. And then uh, the last point here I calculated, uh, add, wrapping it in byte string would add two to three bytes, additional bytes, depending on the certificate, uh, which would be unwanted, but not uh, it wouldn't uh, be doable. Yeah. Mm. So, any comments? Mm. How to proceed here? Mm. This is Lawrence. One, one, one other comment here is that um, if you did the byte string wrapping, you would guarantee that just about any C4 decoder would be able to, to – you'd be able to work with just about any C4 decoder. It would be more or less a guarantee uh, um, where, you know, as it is, you know, I haven't done a scientific study either, but, you know, as it is, uh, there's definitely some C4 decoders that uh, – uh, would have to be modified or couldn't be used. Do we do we think these Seabors libraries will stay like they are, or will they in the future support Seabors sequences, which was uh, not so long ago uh, published as an RFC? Um, Karsten, in a similar question, Karsten commented. Before that, it was better to change the tool than the specification. Mm. Trade-off, and th there is no correct mm. answer here. So uh, yeah. we, we essentially just have to see, is the deployment headache uh, that, that uh, Lawrence has identified as not entirely trivial, is that worth saving two or three Bytes, and then th that's really uh, a decision that, that I don't have a strong position on. All I wanted to say is um, the the headache is there, but it's probably not a splitting he headache. Right, and, and it's not such a big headache because. The, the start offset is easy. It's it's always zero, and the end offset is the the structure is not complicated. Actually, if I were implementing this, uh, I would cheat and uh, uh, take the the algorithm identifier I find, uh, convert that into uh, a number for the length of the signature. And uh, if that is a, a fixed number, my my work is easy. Yeah. But not from the end. Yeah. I will at least I, I will make an issue out of this. I think if it significantly if it helps with implementation i think 2 to 3 bytes are acceptable but then we should um, they should be clear that this is really needed um. so one other comment on uh, my own seaboard decoder has a couple of extra features that um help it deal with uh um by by string wrapping, particularly for Kose. So um I I that's one of the reasons I like that is that um you know we we already have this convention of doing it for Kose and and, and maybe some decoders have uh, a way of dealing with Kose in inefficient ways. Any other, any more comments on CBOR certificates? Uh, I will make an issue out of this and we'll wait and see. Otherwise, I think 06 version um, might come some, sometime in January or something. Yeah. 
That sounds good. There is one more slide. Okay, yes. Okay. Yes, uh, for the last topic, I think that sounds good. Let's uh, uh, take some more time to think about it and uh, discuss it again. But yes, for now, it's not clear which way is better. Okay. So, procedural question: um, mm -hmm. what, what is the point in time when we actually want to adopt this? Normally, it's after we recharter, <laughs> and uh, yes, but we can make the decision that we want to adopt this in parallel with the rechartering. We cannot formally adopt it until it's in our charter, but we can make the decision. And since the decision involves a timeout, uh, I think we could start doing that now. Sounds good. Yes, yeah, sounds good to me. I don't know if Ben or Matthew has some comments. No, that seems reasonable. Okay, then we can, well, I guess we'll need to formulate it. Conditional adoption call. Okay. But conditional on the, the uh, rechartering. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds good to me. So we will add it to the minutes as an action item. Okay. Thanks, Karsten. Okay. So with that, I think we are, okay, Ben says in Jabber that he's not objecting to, to the decision. So that's perfect. Uh, then any other business? Well, if not, uh, thank you everyone for uh, your participation and uh, we wish you happy holidays and see you uh, or talk to you next year. <laughs> uh, I can try. Let's see. Thank you. Holidays to you too. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Happy holidays. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.